Hello, and thank you for joining us on Axe's official YouTube channel. My name is Michael Birch, and I am Axe Game Man's community educator and resource coordinator. What you're about to watch is an edited community health forum recorded on January the 28th, 2021, about HIV stigma. Please be mindful that any information presented here is only as current as of that date. As a result of the COVID-19 pandemic, ACT has gone digital and is now offering our Community Health Forum series online via Zoom webinar. For more information about how you can watch our forums live, to suggest a future topic, give feedback, or ask questions, email me at mbirch at actoronto.org. As always, ACT would like to thank our sponsors, Vive Healthcare, Merck, Gilead, and The Village Pharmacy. Without their generous support, we could not bring you these forums. I would also like to thank our presenters, James and Jason. Lastly, for up-to-date information about ACT and our programming, please visit us online at www.actoronto.org or on any of our numerous socials. Thank you. Please enjoy this presentation and don't forget to comment and subscribe below. So to start, uh, I always like to do so with a land acknowledgement and a PHA acknowledgement. Uh, this is being filmed uh, out of the GTA, out of Toronto, Canada. Uh, so for some of you who may be joining us from other provinces, this may not be applicable to where you are, but this is applicable to where we're at. So as many of us are settlers on this land, it is our collective responsibility to pay respect and recognize that this land is a traditional territory of the Mississauga of the New Credit First Nations, and we are here because this land was occupied. It is our collective responsibility to recognize our colonial histories and present day implications and to honor, protect and sustain this land. Also central to the successes we have achieved has been the greater involvement and meaningful engagement of people living with HIV who continue to share their lives, experiences and passion in the fight against HIV. We are indebted to the millions of people living with HIV from our past, our present and our future. Uh, so really quickly, I just wanted to talk about a couple of things that are happening in community that I thought that uh, some of you may be interested in. Uh, so first off, ACTS offices continue to be closed to the public due to Corona. Uh, however, um, many of our services are continuing, uh, but virtually. One of the services that isn't continuing virtually is our prophylactic distribution program. So we are offering curbside pickup on Fridays. Um, if you're interested in obtaining condoms or lube, and that includes uh, Trojans, like extra large condoms, snug condoms, ripped condoms, glow in the dark condoms. Uh, if you're looking for insertive condoms, uh, if you're looking for uh, water-based lube, if you're looking for silicone-based lube, yada, 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 send me an email uh, and we can coordinate a time on a Friday afternoon for you to stop by our offices at 543 Young Street and I can meet you on the curb and I can give you a little goodie bag. We're also supplying harm reduction uh, tools as well. So if you are looking for uh, fresh supplies, I can help you out with that. We've got pipes, uh, needles, anything you could need, just send me an email and we can coordinate that. So without further ado, I want to uh, pass it over to our presenters, uh, James and Jason. Uh, I'm going to allow them to introduce themselves and then we're going to launch into a video. And at the end of the video, which I believe is about 26 minutes long, uh, Jason and James are going to answer some of your questions that you have. And during the presentation, I'm going to be in the chat function as well, sharing links uh, and answering potentially any questions uh, that you might have that I can't answer. Uh, but again, I'll ask you to leave all your questions to the end of the presentation. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to you guys. Great. Thank you, Michael. We're very happy to be here. My name is James Watson, and I'm the National HIV Stigma Index uh, Coordinator. Um, I've been working on this study for a couple of years now. Um, and we've been collecting data throughout the province of Ontario, about 724 participants, about half of which from the GTA. Um, and we'll be showing you uh, uh, a video today that focuses on the GTA findings, um, along with um, our, uh, our approach to working with peer researchers um, and some, um, uh, some of the KTE work we're doing with the Positive Effect website. So that's me. I'll pass it over to Jason. Say hello. Hey everyone, nice to, well, nice to see you all, well, not see you all. Um, I'm Jason, I'm a PhD student at the University of Toronto, and I work on the HIV stigma index. I do mostly the data analysis and all of the research activities. 
Great. So thank you, Jason. So I'm going to share my screen. So enjoy and we'll talk to you afterwards. The HIV Stigma Index is an international standardized tool to gather data on how stigma and discrimination impact the lives of people living with HIV. This project was developed by a partnership between the International Planned Parenthood Federation and the Global Network of People Living with HIV, the International Community of Women Living with HIV, and the Joint United Nations Program on HIV and AIDS. First launched in 2008, the HIV Stigma Index has since been implemented in more than 100 countries. Well over 100,000 people living with HIV have been interviewed by 1,600 trained peer researchers. It's the world's largest social research project developed and implemented by people living with HIV. While our international collaborations ground this important project, my colleagues and I at the MAP Center for Urban Health Solutions which is a world-leading research center dedicated to tackling complex urban health issues, and Reach Nexus, a national network and broker of pragmatic solutions with a common goal of ending Canada's HIV epidemic. Together, we are the teams responsible for this study's implementation, ongoing execution and analysis, and ultimately, the invaluable knowledge transfer and exchange resulting from it. This video will focus on the Canadian implementation of the Stigma Index and more specifically on Ontario and the data collected in the Greater Toronto Area. We will also discuss our approach to working with peer researchers and their importance to the ongoing success of this study in the fight against HIV stigma. My name is James Watson and I'm the National and Ontario Coordinator for the HIV Stigma Index here in Canada. I've been living with HIV for over 25 years, and unfortunately, like all people living with HIV, I'm also a bit of an expert at living with HIV stigma. Ending HIV stigma in Canada is going to be one heck of a battle, but I'm encouraged by the study. The HIV stigma index with its multi-pronged community-led approach championed by peer researchers is going to go a long way to win this fight. With community members leading the charge, we can produce meaningful results and move them quickly into action. And I think that history has proven that when people living with HIV are organized and mobilized, we are a powerful force to be reckoned with. Another unique dimension to this study is that it's been created as a contact-based intervention, meaning that the peer-to-peer -peer interview experience is an intentional exchange of knowledge and lived experience meant to build resiliency. This is a study that fights stigma in real time, peer to peer. Let's have a look at the study objectives. We want to understand how the social determinants of health are interacting with stigma and why some people experience stigma differently or are more resilient than others. We also want to have a look at where stigma is more prevalent geographically and structurally. Why are we still experiencing stigma in our medical system? But of course, the most exciting objective is mobilizing the data into action. Community champions and academic researchers working side by side to develop meaningful and measurable interventions. A surefire way of bringing about almost immediate social change for people living with HIV is by hiring and training and working with them as peer researchers. And one of the central tenets of our peer researcher approach is the recognition that the lived experiences of people living with HIV are equal in value to academic achievement, that their lived experience is expertise. These concepts around value and meaningful engagement are really powerful and empowering. Peer researchers complement and complete the scientific research process and have become one of the most important drivers 
and the spirit of health research in Canada. We wouldn't be where we are today without the peer researcher movement. As we talk about peer research, I think we need to understand how we got here. The HIV sector is certainly a trailblazer in the peer researcher movement, and one of the key factors of its success is because unlike some other research communities, ours is grounded in a fight for our lives, in activism. All peers really in the HIV sector stand on the shoulders of giants, of the activists of the 80s, who demanded that we be meaningfully involved in the processes and systems that affected our future. It was from this fight for meaningful engagement that eventually, of course, produced the JIPA-MIPA principles, or the greater and meaningful involvement of people living with HIV and AIDS. And these principles that have been adopted by the United Nations call for the active and meaningful participation of people living with HIV in all aspects of policies and programs, including the research that affects them. And the Stigma Index is a prime example of JIPA and MIPA in action. And our peer researchers lead the way. I think that peer researchers are, are catalysts of change, like that in a way. It's like I really love community-based research. I like the idea of it. I like the, the values of it and the goals of it and how it's supposed to transform a community. I think community-based research is a transformative thing, both for individuals and for a community. And I really like being a part of that. And I think that being a peer researcher, you're, you're right at the ground floor, the grassroots of it all. Like we're the ones who see the actual people that the research is about. So if, if I do a fabulous interview and that person goes away feeling good, then I know that like I was a part of something good. Peer researchers working in the HIV stigma index, like in many community-based research studies, have day-to-day -day duties, and these include screening and recruiting participants, seeking informed consent, collecting the data using a variety of different methods, keeping the data safe and confidential, completing administrative duties, and contributing to the data analysis and the dissemination of findings. But the peer researcher role is a complex one with emotional twists and turns. Being so close to the subject matter and without proper supports can be stressful and triggering and lead to emotional burnout. We expect peer researchers and pay them to constantly externalize and reflect upon and apply their lived experience to their work through all phases of the research. They perform a type of emotional labor and are expected to be highly attuned to people living with HIV from all walks of life. And with this emotional labor, almost always comes disclosure. In an interview setting, peer researchers disclose strategically to encourage participants to offer deeper and more truthful responses. They disclose to the research team members, in committees and meetings, and often in dissemination activities. But this constant disclosure and emotional labor is not easy and requires a support structure that offers both formal and informal supports. You're left in this position of trust where you're carrying this person's story, except it's one person's story and 10 people's story and 20 people's story. And you're carrying all these stories that impact your heart. And, and unless, unless you're really skilled at, at finding support and accessing support and giving away these people's gifts to you, you walk around carrying their pain. You take their pain from them, but then you carry it. As patient engagement and peer research becomes more mainstream, it's opening broad and exciting discussions around equity and sustainability, as well as the unique support needs peer researchers might need to thrive in this complex and demanding role. In the HIV Stigma Index, we are working hard to be on the leading edge of peer researcher support. Over the years, we've developed a PRA support framework that guides how we work with peer researchers, which allows for meaningful engagement at all levels of the research process. This framework moves JIPA theory into meaningful practice and has six broad components of support, administrative, educational, 
economic, emotional and self-care, cultural and methodological. If you'd like to learn more, I recommend reading our paper authored by myself and Dr. Francisco Ibanez Carrasco titled Supporting Peer Researchers, Recommendations from Our Lived Experience, Expertise in Community-Based Research in Canada in the Harm Reduction Journal. The benefits to the research of working with peer researchers are extraordinary. If our peer researchers are supported appropriately to thrive, they can provide first-hand issue expertise and help bridge that knowledge between the community and academic researchers. We rely on our peer researchers to help recruit harder to reach populations and create an interview environment that's supportive and encouraging, where participants feel comfortable to share their lived experiences openly. And all of this enhances the quality of the data we collect. Our peer researchers help legitimize our study by standing confidently as an integral and outward facing part of our study team. We're at various stages of implementing the HIV Stigma Index across the country and scaling up a number of ongoing stigma-related projects in the provinces. But in Ontario specifically, we've hired and trained 15 peer researchers who have completed 724 quantitative interviews in five regions of the province. We are now conducting data analysis, disseminating findings, as well as mobilizing various KTE products through the Positive Effect website, social media, and the HIV stigma community of practice. We're also about to launch a second phase of online quantitative data collection. Let's turn our attention to the survey tool. The core survey questions are kept the same across the country and around the world but questions are added to capture regional priorities in each of the provinces. The core survey sections reveal the wide range of issues explored related to HIV stigma. They include topics like resiliency and experiences of stigma, social support and life engagement, disclosure, internalized stigma, and interactions with healthcare services. We've also added validated measures to the survey. We added validated measures to the survey so we could compare and quantify key determinants of health. Validated measures are questions that have been independently proven to accurately measure a certain construct and are often used in population health surveys. Some examples of these scales include BUN's Adapted HIV Stigma Scale that explores different types of stigma. It measures internalized, perceived, and enacted stigma the Connor Davidson Resilience Scale that's used to measure a person's ability to bounce back from certain negative situations, and Mallory's Healthcare Empowerment Scale used to measure a person's level of engagement in their own healthcare management. My name is Jason Lo Hog Tian, and I'm a graduate student working on the data analysis for the HIV Stigma Index, and I'm going to go through a brief overview of the preliminary findings from the study. First, we'll take a look at a breakdown of our sample. There were 341 participants from the Greater Toronto Area. The average age was 47, and we had quite an experienced sample with an average of 14 years living with HIV. The majority of participants had completed more than high school education. For sexual orientation, most people were gay or lesbian, with just under a third heterosexual, and we even had a small percentage of bisexual individuals. More than half of the sample were Caucasian, but we did meet recruitment targets for other key populations, including African, Caribbean and Black individuals, Asian and Pacific Islanders, and Indigenous peoples. The focus of the HIV Stigma Index is of course stigma, which is a complicated and multifaceted social process. To capture the nuances of stigma, we break it down into different dimensions or types, and examine how they each interact with other mechanisms and with each other to impact health outcomes. Internalized stigma is the shame and guilt that forms when people accept negative assumptions about their character because they have HIV. Almost half of the participants had significant levels of internalized stigma. The 
more I work with uh, issues on stigma, I realize that I self-stigmatize myself. But my whole uh, purpose of getting involved in HIV's uh, work was to put a face and a story to the, the virus. And I have been doing that all along, so why do it now? <laughs> so. Enacted stigma involves experiences of discrimination, prejudice, or stereotyping from others because of your HIV status. About 6 out of 10 people had significant enacted stigma. The reality is, and the purpose of this study is, that that's not what our world is like. People die. People get killed. People get bashed. People lose their jobs. People lose their housing. Like, those things happen today. People, people suffer if they disclose their status, because the world is full of stigma. And lastly, anticipated stigma is about the expectation of discrimination, prejudice, or stereotyping from others in the future due to your HIV status. This was the most common type of stigma, with 85% of the sample experiencing significant levels of anticipated stigma. Overall, the rates we're seeing tells us that HIV stigma is alive and well, and affects a large proportion of our sample in many ways. Let's take a brief detour to look at health. One way we capture an individual's overall health and well-being is through self-reported health. This is commonly elicited using one question. In general, how would you rate your health? And participants can respond from poor to excellent. This has been shown to predict key health outcomes such as mortality, disability, comorbidities, and use of healthcare services which makes it an efficient way to gain information about how someone is doing. We decided to examine the relationship between stigma and self-rated health, and here we can see how different types of stigma can have different effects. For those who rate their health as poor, three quarters had significant levels of internalized stigma. This decreases to 40% for those who rate their health as excellent. A similar pattern can be seen with enacted stigma. Rates of enacted stigma decrease by almost half for people who rate their health as excellent compared to those who rate it as poor. This tells us that internalized and enacted stigma may significantly contribute to self-rated health and by extension real life health and well-being. On the other hand, anticipated stigma remains relatively high regardless of self-rated health. This may mean that the expectation that others will treat you poorly because of your HIV status is not really linked to overall health. It may impact an individual in another way. Now let's look at the rates of some other social and health factors that may have important interactions with stigma and pose a risk to health and well-being. 18% of our sample had significant alcohol use, 28% had significant drug use, and 37% had significant depression. Levels of socioeconomic factors were higher still. Over half of our sample have lacked basic needs such as food, shelter, and clothing. 6 out of 10 are unemployed, and 3 quarters have an income below $30,000. This gives you a picture of the variety of challenges that people living with HIV in our sample are facing. Dealing with any one of these alone can pose a challenge, and unfortunately, these health risks often co-occur. We decided to create a health risk score by adding up the number of health risks each person had. When examining the impact of these health risks on levels of stigma, we can see that they have an additive effect. Those who had zero of those health risks were less likely to experience significant levels of internalized or enacted stigma. The rates of these two types of stigma increase steadily as you continue to add health risks. People who have four or more health risks were more than twice as likely to experience internalized and enacted stigma. As we have seen before, anticipated stigma remains high and does not appear to be affected by the number of health risks one experiences.
We also looked at some factors thought to protect or buffer against the negative impact of stigma. We examined social support, which is the extent to which you have the support of others to face stressful situations, resiliency, or the ability to bounce back after stressful events, tragedy or trauma, and self-efficacy of treatment, or one's ability to adhere to treatment plans. Over half of the sample had moderate or high levels of social support, more than two-thirds had moderate or high resiliency, and nine out of ten people had moderate or high self-efficacy. This shows that there are significant levels of these protective factors at people's disposal, and these resources could help with coping. Of course, there are still improvements to be made, and there is a significant proportion of people with low levels of these protective factors, especially social support. Like for the health risks, we added up the number of protective factors each person had. This time, if a person had moderate levels of a protective factor, they got one point, and if they had high levels, they got two. We then examined how the types of stigma changed with the number of protective factors. Levels of internalized and enacted stigma decreased significantly with each added protective factor. This shows that social support, resiliency and self-efficacy, all of which can be taught and learned, may have significant potential to decrease levels of stigma. There was even a minor decrease in rates of anticipated stigma, which has remained consistently high so far, for those who had multiple protective factors, again highlighting the potential for stigma to be reduced. To summarize, when looking at the rates in our sample, we can see that HIV stigma is alive and well, affecting people living with HIV in different ways. We looked at the different types of stigma and found that internalized and enacted stigma have a significant impact on an individual's overall health and well-being. We also saw how other mental health, substance use and socioeconomic risk factors can add up to contribute to higher levels of stigma. Lastly, we examined resiliency, social support, and self-efficacy, and saw that these factors have the potential to reduce the burden of stigma on the lives of people living with HIV. You might already be thinking of how to continue this conversation or, or get involved in something to reduce HIV stigma in your community. While there are lots of things to do, here are a few things that we're engaged with that we're encouraging others to rally around as well. On a personal level, it's important for us to continue to challenge misconceptions of HIV and pay attention to our biases and encourage the use of inclusive language in all aspects of our lives. By remaining aware of stigma's impact and understanding how it spreads, either consciously or unconsciously, we can all play a role in improving the health and well-being for people living with HIV. Highlighted in the video, we saw that strong social support can reconcile or mediate the negative impacts associated with stigma. You know, we all have a role to play here. So are there things that we can do to be a better friend, a better neighbor or community member? There are some good programs and work opportunities for community members, but we need to continue to strengthen and develop these programs and create policies that support capacity building and meaningful employment for people living with HIV. Any of the things that I've gone through that have made me examine my value system and what's important to me and how I want to live my life have, have been a positive effect. To be open about something that's so personal for me and that affects me, not just today, but for the rest of my life. And I'm positive, I'm trans, and I'm happy. ThePositiveEffect.org was born from a desire to share the stories of people living with HIV and their allies, to spark dialogue, and communicate around issues related to stigma. It provides a collaborative and creative platform for people's voices and stories and experiences to be heard and creates an opportunity for all of us to connect. 
We hope that this video will inspire you to submit a story or share an experience related to the topics discussed. Visit the Positive Effect website or email hello at positiveeffect.org for more information. And if I can help others in whatever way um, that to help eliminate that stigma, um, to put a face to HIV, to um, realize that uh, I am, HIV doesn't define me. I am Mary, I am uh, a mother, a grandmother, I am a friend, a colleague, and I could be your next door neighbor, um, the person you work with, and it's HIV should not be something that we're afraid of. HIV can can I hope that I can help that overcome that stigma. What did everyone think of the video? Perfect. Steven says, excellent video. Thank you to all the panelists. Really interesting uh, statistics um, around social support and the lack thereof uh, and how high it was. It was really surprising to me when I first saw the video. I think it was 42% had low levels of social support. Um, it definitely Definitely made me think about the programming that we offer here at ACT and, um, you know, sometimes as service providers, people don't always make the connections between what is the value inherent in someone's health and offering something like a coffee night or a book club. And I think what your presentation, not your presentation, but the study itself lays out really well is that actually these things have huge health outcomes uh, for folks. And having that social support can be incredibly beneficial. And the fact that it's so lacking, um, it's really sad. Was yeah, there anything definitely. that was there anything that came out of the study, uh, either James or Jason, that really surprised you? Uh, well, you, you know, in a lot of ways, a lot. I think a lot of these things are are. Um, I guess my, I, I, I wasn't surprised. We, I kind of already know, you know, you know, the isolation and you know. Um, you kind of already know that uh, if you don't have these protective factors, that uh, something's going to go wrong, and um, you know, um, and also that you know all levels of stigma or all types of stigma are sort of even across the board. Um, um, I think that that's, uh, that was a bit of a surprise for me, maybe, and I guess it's still a bit of a mystery yet. And Jason, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but why? What's the, the it's enacted and. Um, internalized stigma are affected more affected by protective factors than uh the other what's the other type of stigma? anticipatory, anticipatory? Yeah, the anticipated stigma yeah 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 i guess that's still more research or more analysis still needs to be done to sort that out um, i think the high levels of anticipatory stigma were really interesting as well um i think with covid so okay two so two thoughts so there's this idea of um um, heightened anxiety that sort of we as gay men uh, go through life, um, you know, being hyper aware of our surroundings and always checking to make sure that a space is safe for us to be who we are. And then when you add HIV on top of that, it's a further compounding of these issues that you have where you're hyper vigilant and you're very uh, aware all the time sort of of, of your surroundings. And anticipatory stigma really lays that out. And I think what's sort of, we'll talk a little bit about it tomorrow, um, is the idea that I think that for some of our HIV negative, heterosexual, cisgender, white counterparts, that they've never really experienced going through life being hypervigilant. And now COVID is hit 
and they're feeling all of this anxiety and pressure um, that they've never felt before. And I've had some really interesting conversations with people where I'm like, yeah, like, welcome to living with HIV. Like, this is what it can be like, you know? It's this thing that's always sort of hanging over your shoulder. You're constantly reminded of it. You don't go a day without thinking about it because you're taking that pill or you're having those conversations with your partners and it impacts you and it drains you and it depresses you. And, uh, and, and I think it's a teachable moment for a lot of, of people who are kind of making those connections now. Yeah, good point. Absolutely. So we've got a comment. Uh, as someone who's paused, I anticipate a certain amount of stigma. I can process ignorance as a lack of knowledge, but I find it difficult to accept stigmatizing behaviors from individuals who should know better. Yes. Educated yet unwilling to accept. I'm never sure how to address this hurtful bias. Yeah, I feel the same way. Uh, you know, I think all of us who are HIV positive had experiences with people who are university educated, who uh, may work in fields where they should have an understanding of bloodborne pathogens, uh, who may be queer themselves, who are completely ignorant to HIV, completely stigmatizing, uh, and have no desire to change their behaviors or see nothing wrong with it. And I think when you confront that, yeah, exactly. And when you confront that, it's 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 mind boggling. I think that just shows the effects of stigma, right, Jason? That, or James, sorry, that it's like so overpowering uh, to people's sense of uh, rationality. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and, you know, I think that's part of what we're, what the positive effect uh, movement and websites trying to do is to, is to correct misinformation and reach out beyond people who are living with HIV, um, because you know that's really where the issue is, right? And uh, uh, and I think in order to you know the study showing that we you know that we you know we have to find ways to, to build resiliency and strengthen ourselves, and uh, but in the meantime we need to be correcting misinformation and ignorance and, and bias in the in the community, um, and. Uh, you know, disclosure is an issue, um, but that's why it's, it's interesting with the stigma index, with the peer researchers, um, part of the criteria, and it doesn't, this doesn't happen in every community-based research study, but part of the criteria, criteria for hiring peer researchers is that they had to be, they had to be comfortable with disclosing their status. Um, it, um, so, in order to sort of be stigma champions in a way. Um, and I mean, disclosing the status to the participants. Um, and uh, because I think that's, I think it's, that's what it really takes is this peer to peer support and peer to peer encouragement. And also people who could stand up and be forward facing um, to uh, help move or correct this misinformation that's out there. Uh, we've got a really great question. Uh, so how have peer researchers' lives been affected by working on the project? Do people go on to become researchers themselves or use experience to help their job searches, et cetera? And are you tracking those effects? That's a good, great question. I, um, I am, I, personally, I'm not, we're not tracking the, their effects, but I can tell you, I mean, I've worked with peer researchers for probably 11 years. I started my career as a peer researcher. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, um, so people have gone off um, to work in ASOs or gone off to work in community organizations, gone off to work in uh, a whole raft, uh, gone off to work at the airport to do, you know, be a mechanic. Um, people have gone off to do all sorts of different work. And uh, some people choose to remain peer researchers because it suits their lifestyle. Um, and uh, other people have gone off to be research coordinators or do things like what I'm doing. Um, but, uh, and in other cases, you know, people are struggling and have life challenges that um, uh, this work, uh, because it's, because we uh, live by the community-based research principles, right? It was of equity and supporting each other. So, uh, uh, you know, so this work is there for them to help support them in many ways. Um, but that's not everybody, you know. It, 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 uh, this work is uh, um, this work is for a variety of different people, um, and we try to be as flexible as we can and as supportive as we can. But there's been some great success stories. 
you know, if that's what success looks like to you. Right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I would recommend if you're interested in peer research, uh, to keep an eye out for uh, Axe social media. We try to share um, job opportunities that do become available in regards to peer research on our social media to alert people. Uh, there's also a fantastic group on Facebook called Jobs for Queers Toronto, which I would also recommend if you're on Facebook, checking out, joining the group. Uh, and sometimes uh, people will post in that group uh, around opportunities for research. Uh, we've got an interesting comment. Um, it says, I once stayed at a friend's condo and after leaving the next day, his mother, an educated medical lab tech, handed him a bottle of bleach so that he could begin the process of sterilizing his washroom. This was just five years ago. Well, ignorance knows no bounds, right? So You must have heard like, Jason and James, you must have heard like a million stories like that when you were doing this index study. Yeah, I mean, the peer researchers for sure, right? So because this was a quantitative survey, um, but the peer researchers for sure. I mean, that's, you know, with even with a quantitative survey and the peer researchers are interviewing the participants because it's, it's supposed to act as like an intervention. Um, so they're sharing stories um, and some troubling stories like this um, all the time. And, uh, you know, it, it, it takes its toll. But hopefully leaving that interview experience, people are, uh, you know, feeling supported and better. I would like to, because you, there's a lot, you met, you're mentioning, there's a lot of, um, I guess, queer reference, right? To, to, um, uh, to what you're speaking about. And I would like, I don't know if Jason, if you can remember from, because we presented for the Gay Men's Sexual Health Alliance and we did the cut of the data, um, uh, 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 a cut of the data for queer, uh, queer men in the province. Um, and I, I just try to get an idea of those numbers were very similar, were they not, Jason? And 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 how what, what was the participant numbers for that? Do you remember? Um, I don't remember the exact numbers. Uh, we did do a presentation, yeah, for GMSH. It, that one was just uh, gained by sexual men who were analyzed, um, and uh, over half of them. Are GBMSM, so um, it's like what three hundred and forty something people in the sample. Right. Um, so and yeah, it was similar numbers to what we saw. Obviously, because they're the majority, they're all the people that um, yeah. The data looks very similar um, when looking at just uh, GBMSM. We got a comment. Thank you to our presenters. Yes, uh, James and Jason, you were amazing. Uh, another thank you. Uh, thank you for the presentation, data, and conversation. Uh, this was a really good conversation, actually, and I'm really glad that people felt comfortable to talk about some, uh, some pretty heavy stuff. Uh, thanks for having us. You're very welcome. Yep, thanks. It's been great. Great. Good night, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.